Hello and welcome to Street 391. Today we continue to talk about Trong Nu Tang's A Viet Cong Memoir. And the uh, of the chapters that were listed for today's reading, like I did for the last video, I'm going to talk about a couple of chapters that I just to kind of model how I go through things chapter by chapter. One of them was kind of one of the longer chapters that was assigned for today. And one of them was maybe even the shortest or close to the shortest. So I chose to go with chapter 17 and chapter 23. Chapter 17 talks about 1972 and the extent to which Tang considered it to be a watershed, whereas chapter 23 talks kind of about, um, or his frustrations really, about the supposed political unification of Vietnam after the fall of Saigon in 75 and the march of North Vietnamese troops to the south. So kind of a short video today, um, again, but just to kind of get things up and running and set you up. And as always, feel free to reach out um, and, you know, send me a message on Zoom. Remember that you can pick any one discussion topic from any of the videos for this week uh, to be your response paper for the week. So let me talk about it. So chapter 17 to get started with. So um, effectively, you know, he talks a lot about kind of uh, the actions of the provisional government and what they were hoping to do. And for me, there was kind of three things that really stick out. Um, one, it's very obvious that um, uh, from the way he talks about internal processes, that um, communist ideas and socialist ideas, and not just their ideas, but their processes, their ways of actually organizing political movements and everything else, have clearly filtered through the NLF at the highest leadership. He himself is even talking about this fairly regularly, uh, the importance of certain types of socialist leadership and everything else. Secondly, that um, they were very, very aware of what they saw in 1972 um, as uh, decaying morale back in the United States and collapsing support for the war. They also believed that they could have a role in kind of continuing to drive this. Now, I think we get into interesting territory here, and I think it's important to note that even though I'm taking out these two chapters to talk about them, none of these chapters exist in isolation. So even, you know, the points that I'm taking from each chapter are also being informed by what I'm seeing in the rest of the memoir as well. But there's an interesting element here, an inter interesting question for us as historians. Is Tang overrating um, what he was able to do or what he and his fellow Vietnamese activists were able to do? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what, you, what, they're, what they're seeking to do. He kind of takes credit to a certain extent um, for kind of affecting the 68 election, um, which I think they can do after the Tet Offensive. Certainly it sees Lyndon Baines Johnson step down. But he talks in this chapter, in chapter 17, about seeking to affect the 1972 election. Now, spoiler, um, 1972 election goes very, very well for Richard Nixon. He wins in an absolute massive landslide, um, despite all the controversy around him. Court of Watergate doesn't really break until after. The Watergate Hotel break-in was part of the, the election campaign going up to 1972. So um, that's all kind of an interesting thing. At the same time, I don't mean to imply that Tang is wrong or that he's powerless. There's, I think what's interesting here is that there's a key element of um, awareness uh, of what the conflict involves, and it involves more than military considerations. And this is something he talks about specifically um, when he's talking about kind of how the Americans are looking at things, that the Americans are effectively, uh, both the Johnson and the Nixon administrations have fallen into the trap that the French had fallen into, which is they kept focusing on the military angle of the war. And there's a lot of truth to the way he's talking about this. I mean, this is the thing, like even, you know, uh, people after the Vietnam War ended on the American side who felt that the Americans could have handled it differently. Uh, many of those people like to talk about the whole, you know, we tried to win a war with one hand tied behind our back or perhaps even two hands tied behind our back. Um, this sense that, uh, you know, listen, Westmoreland was asking LBJ for the troops and these guys were asking people for the troops and they were never given the, that kind of, they were never given the, the ability to actually leverage American superiority and American advantages over um, their Vietnamese opponents. Now, that's a whole very interesting, very large question. What's interesting for us in this source is the extent to which Tang was aware of that and was thinking about it, was talking about it. Now, he's writing in the 1980s, and that's a very important thing to be thinking about as well. The fact that, um, you know, we all change, you know, and when you're when you're reflecting on things that happened seven or eight years ago, particularly when it's been a very dramatic seven or eight years. And for this author, it was a very dramatic, seven, you know, seven or eight years. As you see by the end of the book, he's exiled. He's effectively kind of a... He's effectively one of these Vietnamese boat people that gets talked about in the 1980s to a certain extent and ends up living his life out in France. Things work out quite well for him in the end, but it's an extremely traumatic and very difficult um, seven to eight years. So, you know, a lot can happen. Um, 
you guys are still, you know, young young adults. So I know eight years ago you were very, very young. So kind of a lot has changed. Um, and that's a very kind of changing time in your life and everything. But I can tell you that it still continues. Like it might, if I look back to 10 years ago from now, um, I was much closer to your age than mine, of course. And, 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 and things are different. And the way you think about things is different. So that's something to be thinking about when we're looking at this source that, you know, his own appeal, his own kind of ways of looking at things are going to be different. But also it works in both directions, which is that perhaps this has given him additional perspective and he's really convinced, listen, the Americans never got it. it uh, you know, this concept of people's war was always a huge thing. Um, and because they didn't get that, that's basically why they lost. And then finally, the third thing for chapter 17 um, is, you know, that the reality of, of Vietnam um, that the politics are more regional and more complex than the Americans ever realized. And this is something that's a theme throughout the entire book. And what makes the book really very interesting is that, you know, this idea that once the Americans leave, Vietnam reunifies and everything is fine just isn't true. There is a North versus South divide here. Um, and not kind of a communist North versus American South, but a Vietnamese North versus a Vietnamese South. This is one of, the, in my opinion, this is one of the most valuable things to get out of um, this book. It, it, it is, it is, although of course he talks with the Americans quite a lot, that's kind of the point of the book to a certain extent, he's talking about a Vietnamese political situation that is complex. Now it's intriguing, I mean they, they seem to be aware of what's going on in the United States, they're reading those American New York Times editorial articles and everything else, they're, they're taking comfort from that, they, they see it as something they can, they can manipulate, but they're willing to engage in these kind of international propaganda discussions to further Vietnamese goals, and then what's going to happen when reunification happens. So that's largely what chapter 23 talks about, right? And chapter 23 is very short, um, and effectively is just registering Tang's deep disappointment and what he believes happens, which is, you know, he says the North comes in and the North is very, very overbearing. What I think is very interesting is that he identifies clear functional reasons for that, which is, listen, they had a specific type of government in North Vietnam um, that was focused on austerity for one thing and had very specific kinds of um, approaches to use of funds and everything else. Of course, in you know, North Vietnam, like all communist countries in the 70s, was what's called a planned economy or a command economy. So, you know, prices are not dictating um, supply. Demand, supply and demand is a concept that exists, but the state believes that it can manage that by establishing quotas and telling various sections of the economy, the industry, you should produce X amount of this and, you know, we will buy, you know, Y amount of it and everything else. In practice, this typically um, added up to a fairly austere economic reality. So, you have these uh, North Vietnamese politicians and, 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 and members of the party coming south to Vietnam and they're applying what, they're applying lessons of what has worked in North Vietnam, but South Vietnam and North Vietnam are very, very different. And one of the fascinating little kind of uh, nuggets of information I think we get out of this book is at least according to him, some of these guys come to the south and they come to Saigon and Saigon, which has kind of been set up you know, critics would call it a flesh pot, I suppose, but certainly it's it's kind of an issue. Um, it's a decadent city compared to somewhere like Hanoi and other parts of the north that these guys uh, become very excited by that. And effectively, you know, in fact, Tang describes them as locusts descending on the city and compare with each, and, and they compete with each other. So you have this, this issue that for Tang, at least, it's yet another example of outsiders coming and kind of just, you know, harvesting his land and... and, and um, and having a jolly old time and, and perhaps a morally questionable uh, jolly old time. Now, these are Vietnamese people doing it, but they're still external to his identity as a southern Vietnamese person. So even though Vietnam is a very small country, this regionalism is, is, is a really important aspect of understanding the country. And, and you know, going back to chapter 17 and, and many other parts of the book, that the Americans never really understood this, nor did the French. Um, so it's not that there's something specific about America that, you know, Americans are too arrogant or too blind or something, although those accusations have been made and, and that can definitely be talked about um, but they're definitely external to it and they're not they're not understanding this local culture and so finally then from chapter 23 basically that very short chapter confirms a theme running through the book at this point the book really the latter half of the book really focuses on this that Vietnamese regionalism is real that it's a real thing and that the reunification of Vietnam is not you know it's it's not automatically a dream you know as we'll talk about in the coming weeks a lot of a lot of American kind of interaction with the idea of what are we doing in Vietnam? This question that well, we're what we're doing is morally wrong. That we are we are preventing the realization of a, of a nationalist dream. Why can't they have their own country? Well, Tang, at least in his memoir, basically says I didn't get to have my country. I, I that the South was overtaken by the North. 
that they broke specific promises they made to us about reunification being slow and, and, and being a kind of a, a process of increments and everything else, that those promises were broken um, and, and that it wasn't my country anymore. Um, and that he ends up he ends up leaving, as we can see in the book, and, and, and in many part, you know, to a large extent for his own personal safety. So I think it's a fascinating, um, you know, uh, complex depiction of, of what was going on in Vietnam in the mid-1970s. So the discussion question is the same as the last video. Pick a single chapter um, that, you know, and, and discuss how this primary source effectively, you know, further contextualizes um, dynamics that we've been discussing in the course so far. Thanks for watching.